It's September 17, 1849. A hot spell has just snapped, and it's a clear, beautiful evening. The men pull down their window shades and close the doors of their shops. The sun is low on the horizon over the Sacramento River. There'll be a pretty sunset soon. It's a good night to usher in the Jewish New Year. The men walk toward the small front street home of a clothing merchant named Moses Hyman. Hello, Lois. Hello, Joseph. New? How's business? Good, Lois. The rabbi leading the Rosh Hashanah service tonight will be the Reverend Mr. Wolf. These worshipers will go on to form one of the pioneer synagogues of the American West, Congregation B'nai Israel. The men heading for the Hyman House pass a multitude of canvas and wooden buildings that seem to have sprung up overnight. Gold was discovered in Coloma the previous year, and business between the miners and the merchants is brisk. Fortunes are about to be made, and in the years that follow, the world will rush into California. Most of the Jewish immigrants traveled from Poland and Germany. Others came from France, Russia, and England. Many braved their way around Cape Horn directly to San Francisco, a trip that cost $200 in steerage and took up to six months. They came from Europe, they came to the East Coast, they learned the language, and they felt that they could do better by moving west. So some of them thought they might want to be prospectors and uh, search for gold as other prospectors did. But when they got here, they found that it was, a lot of them found it was very difficult, and they thought they could do better by not only having their families with them, but by getting supplies to the miners. Most of these Jewish settlers returned to the trades they had known in Europe. In the early 1850s, some 9,000 people lived in Sacramento. About 200 of them were Jews. Sacramento had become the leading city in the region. Development was sprawling out from Front Street. By this time, the Jewish community had organized into a congregation named the Children of Israel. A Methodist church, the first church building in Sacramento, was consecrated in 1849. This tin-roofed wooden chapel was shipped around the Horn from Baltimore to San Francisco, and then to Sacramento. The Methodists placed it at 7th and L Streets. The young Jewish congregation bought the church building in June 1852, and the new synagogue was consecrated in September. It was the first synagogue west of the Mississippi River to be owned by its members. Congregation B'nai Israel had a home of its own. Over the years, B'nai Israel occupied many buildings. The original synagogue burned in the Great Fire of November 1852. In 1904, the 6th Street building was sold, and the cornerstone was laid for the new 15th Street Temple. President Albert Elkis noted with pride that the new temple, to be built and furnished for $16,000, would be debt-free. The old temple on 15th Street was a two-story building in the corner of the alley. The sanctuary was upstairs, and downstairs they had a, um, a social hall and a very fine stage and a kitchen. As Sacramento's Jewish population boomed after World War II, the 15th Street Temple, now occupied for 40 years, began to show its age. 
Of course, we were fighting to keep the temple from falling down. They, the joke was that they kept it together with baling wire. Finally, White Dalton said, let's build a new temple. Dalton Feldstein, the president of B'nai Israel in 1947, was the guiding light of the new temple on Riverside Boulevard, the house that Dalton built. The new temple was a vision of Dalton. There were a number of reasons for leaving the old temple, uh, but uh, uh, there was no access for anyone with any handicaps. Uh, it was too small. But primarily, it was because Dalton wanted a new temple. Architect Bill Koblick, a member of the congregation, drew up the blueprints. Dalton Feldstein, Rabbi Hausman, Harry Kaufman, and Harry Tonkin collected $250,000 to start the groundbreaking. In Hebrew, we snored. Milt Levinson and I went out every night after dinner. We'd go out snoring for two and three hours. We had so many affairs, so many uh, fundraising affairs, and so many people gave more money than they thought they could afford. But we finally built this temple, and we were all very proud of it because it's, it was a, a new home for our Jewish family. Uh, the sanctuary and the social hall owe, owe a great deal, uh, of course, to Dalton uh, Feldstein and to uh, Harry Lev and to Manny Schwartz. Uh, Manny uh, gave all the uh, drapery for the social hall, and Harry Lev uh, gave the, uh, all the beautiful wood that's in the sanctuary. Dalton donated most of the uh, bima, the ark, that whole wall, the uh, reading table, the uh, decorative gold uh, stuff on the front, and the chairs. The new temple was dedicated in 1954. In the early 1960s, the Buddy Candell Education Wing was added. By 1985, Temple B'nai Israel had been on Riverside Boulevard for more than 30 years. The congregation's membership had grown from 200 individuals to 700 families. It was time to modernize and expand. Past president and architect Al Dreyfus agreed to oversee the design and construction of the temple's renovation. In June 1986, groundbreaking ceremonies were held for the new chapel, library, and office building. The Harry M. Tonkin Memorial Chapel and the Sosnick Library were dedicated in November 1987. The most recent building project, the Opera Courtyard, began in the summer of 1997. It was designed in a style reminiscent of old Jerusalem. The courtyard is surrounded by a stone walkway engraved with the names of B'nai Israel families. The courtyard was dedicated in April 1998. In the early morning darkness of June 18, 1999, B'nai Israel suffered a cruel and wrenching blow. Flames of hate left a devastating scar on Temple B'nai Israel in Sacramento. A pre-dawn arson fire engulfed the temple's library. In a heartening show of support, Gentile clergy, politicians, and a human tide of racially and spiritually diverse people came together to denounce this terrible crime. Rallies were held. Contributions poured in. Thousands of ordinary people shared our shock and our grief. We were not alone. We gather because the synagogues of Sacramento were burned. For our sisters and brothers whose lives have been shattered, may they be uplifted by this our acts of outpouring and love. Send a loud and clear message to those who torched the three synagogues that their crime will find no haven no sanction, no silent ascent. This is the first time that I've stood in this room.
and it's hard to find the right words. And when I put my hand in this light, I see hope. Hope for a future where children will come and play, where we will learn, and we will study, and we will pray, and we will be a part of a greater whole of the Jewish people. Chazak v'yamatz, we will have courage and we will be strong. And we will prevail. Ironically, I think that much more good will come out of the bombing than any harm that was inflicted on us. I think we're going to come across uh, as a stronger congregation, a more involved congregation. Um, I, th I believe that the congregants have come into this with a very healthy attitude. They haven't come away feeling like vic victims at all. They've come away strengthened by the community support, and they've come away with a stronger commitment to Judaism. In its long history, B'nai Israel has suffered the ravages of fire several times. But the true temple doesn't reside in its buildings. It's in the soul and spirit of its members. Over the past 150 years, B'nai Israel has adapted to the changing times and needs of its members. The journey hasn't always been smooth. The earliest controversy was over whether to follow German or Polish religious customs. When B'nai Israel adopted its first constitution in 1857, the congregation chose to worship in the German tradition. There was a lot of dissension between the Polish Jews and the German Jews, and uh, they were so uh, at odds with each other that one group left. The loss of B'nai Israel's building to fire in 1861 motivated the two groups to reunify. Rabbi Abram Simon remembered. The loss sustained reaped a splendid gain, for the flames licked up much of the rancor and hatred. The sorrow brought in its train good fellowship, and in a short while, the two congregations united under the old familiar name, B'nai Israel. For the next few decades, B'nai Israel's services continued to follow the Orthodox traditions. They were conducted on Saturday mornings. The congregation enter and perform their devotions with their heads covered. The ceremony consists of the prayers in Hebrew, the reading of the law by the appointed reader and others called up out of the congregation. The men are habited in the scarf with the memorial fringes. In 1877, Rabbi Isaac Mayer Wise came to Sacramento during a tour of the West to drum up support for the new American Reform Movement. Two years later, B'nai Israel began holding shorter services in English using Wise's prayer book, the Minhag America. Only three men were called up to the Torah instead of the seven formally required. B'nai Israel also dispensed with its shachet, or ritual slaughterer. That four women ordered four lamb's tongues or calves' tongues for a certain Friday night Sabbath dinner and it was known that only one kosher beef was killed. And the women didn't know how they got four kosher tongues from one beef. So they decided that the shoichet was not on the up and up, and he was let go. In 1880, B'nai Israel publicly proclaimed itself a congregation of reformed Israelites. Progress in religious matters they claim to be as necessary and commendable as in political and social life. Hence, so far as the genius of their peculiar faith will allow, they seem resolved to keep up with the times and to conform to modern customs. Reform Judaism provided the pathway for Jews to have it both ways, to be Jews and to be Americans. 
but differences between Reform and Orthodox congregants continued. In the years before the turn of the century, membership numbers fluctuated as conflicts waxed and waned. But a series of outstanding lay leaders provided the guidance the congregation needed. Even in those days, it was difficult to get a minion, and uh, uh, so they had similar problems that they have today. There were also many discussions about whether or not they should wear hats, and uh, they finally decided that the people could do as the men could do as they liked. So, when they had this discussion, the men who wore hats all sat on one side, and those who did not sat on the other side. Throughout the 1890s, a group of highly observant Jews prayed together in the back of Jacob Bloomberg's hat store. In 1900, several Orthodox members of B'nai Israel joined them to form Hevra Turas Moshe, today's Mosaic Law Congregation. In 1885, B'nai Israel formally joined the Reform Movement. The pendulum continued to swing from very liberal to more traditional and back again. But in the first half of the 20th century, the atmosphere was distinctly reform. Our wedding was um, in the um, sanctuary at the temple in 1940, and uh, we were going to have a reform wedding. But we were going to be married under a chuppah, and the men were not going to wear hats. Well, my little Orthodox mother from Brooklyn was there, and she had a fit, so Frank had to go out and get a number of hats, otherwise she would have left the wedding. The services, uh were rather thin. They were uh, the uh, pale uh, 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 standard reform uh, services of the pre-war decades. The old Union uh, prayer book was still being used. There was a great deal of uh, English, very little Hebrew. Uh, the uh, hymns were from uh, the Union hymnal and they really had uh, very little uh, Jewish content in terms of, of uh, melody and sentiment. They uh, it might have been <laughs> very much like the hymns that were sent, sung in the First Methodist Church. Well, now Rabbi Hausman, he came from the from up north, and when our boy was going to be bar mitzvah, he had never done a bar mitzvah at, at all. They didn't do them, you know. Some of the reform temples. <clears throat> had just started to do bar mitzvahs, and he had never done one. This was his first bar mitzvah. I think the most significant change in the temple is that it has become more traditional in its services and so on. Uh, in the era of Rabbi Hausman, no one wore a head covering at all. No one wore a tallis in the temple. Uh, now, if you come into service, you see that Many, many men are wearing head coverings and even wearing talises. The overarching vision that I saw was to move the congregation in a way that could, that people would accept and embrace the, the beauty of Jewish tradition and the idea of the mitzvot, the commandments of Judaism, and all of, and blending them together in a way that would fit in a reform culture, a reformed Jewish culture. A major crisis in B'nai Israel's history erupted in the early 1970s. It centered on Cantor Eli Cohen and eventually precipitated the Great Split. There was a considerable period of time when the temple did not have a rabbi. We were uh, looking for a rabbi and the cantor uh, really assumed the uh, functions and duties of the rabbi. And he endeared himself to a great many people uh, in the temple. But allegations that Cantor Cohn had engaged in serious misconduct came to light. After two rancorous congregational meetings, the board decided not to retain him. A distressing split ensued. At that time, about 40 or 40, maybe 50 at the most, 
of membership left to join Cantor Cohn and his little group. When he left, he took many of our very wonderful workers from the temple, and they formed another synagogue. We lost so many people that were very much involved in the temple, and it was a great sadness. Membership dwindled to about 300 families. The congregation was left badly demoralized. After the trauma of the Great Split in the mid-1970s, B'nai Israel needed a healer, a man of great energy and vision, who would be able to lead the congregation beyond the bitterness of the recent past and to look to a brighter future. It found such a man in Rabbi Lester Frazen. Before I started full-time on the job, I had been told that the, the split had caused what Glazer called, or Glatzer called, the loss of nerve. So, so what we tried to do was to assure the people that the congregation was salvageable and uh, rebuildable and that we could uh, become a viable institution again. It took a good five years before that really came to pass. B'nai Israel has thrived under the leadership of 26 rabbis. Israel's rabbis have had an especially profound impact. The first was Rabbi Harold Reinhardt. Harold Reinhardt was an austere individual, but uh, con extremely uh, congenial. My dad came in 1926, and then he brought mother as a bride in 1928. He went to the Mosaic Law Synagogue, which was a small synagogue, supposedly orthodox, though they had mixed seating even then. And uh, then he came to the temple and was astonished. He heard for the first time a woman soloist singing uh, with the choir, and he met Rabbi Reinhardt, who was a very uh, brilliant and progressive and interesting man. So he affiliated with the temple. When a special service was held in 1927 to commemorate B'nai Israel's 75th anniversary, Rabbi Reinhardt wrote a history of the congregation and composed a hymn to mark the occasion. Zealous of spirit on our jubilee, praise we with grateful hearts the pioneers, whose shining works like diamonds we see in splendor through the seventy-five years. In 1948, Rabbi Irving Hausman was chosen to lead the temple during a time in which major changes took place. When I came to this city 18 years ago, this was a very small town. And um, I felt almost like a pioneer, particularly in my own particular uh, pulpit. It was small, there were very few people of the Jewish faith in the community, about a half of the population that we have now. Uh, but we worked hard, we actually labored, until we really established a fine uh, Jewish community here in this city. Rabbi Hausman was a dynamic figure with a compelling theatrical presence. Before the Lord shall ye be pure. He was more of an actor than, than a rabbi. And he used to give some terrific services. Uh, we enjoyed uh, Rabbi Hausman very much. He really could have been a Shakespearean actor because his sermons were of that type. He would get very dramatic. 
Rabbi Lester Frazen was officially installed as the temple's 25th spiritual leader in January 1974. He instituted many changes. The temple newsletter reported that, for the first time in many years, there will be single services on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur eves, and with no reserved seating. Again, a break with the recent past. Rabbi Frazen touched the lives of many members of the temple. I can't say enough about the personal assistance given to me by Rabbi Frazen upon the death of my husband. He also was very involved in, in um, life cycles such as happy events, the bar mitzvahs, the bat mitzvahs, the weddings, etc. He did them all with ease and perfection. Rabbi Frazen served for 20 years, a record for the temple. In June of 1995, he led services at B'nai Israel for the last time. Rabbi Brad Bloom succeeded him. A professionally trained choir sang at B'nai Israel for the first time when the 6th Street building was consecrated in 1864. Two years later, the congregation acquired an organ, an organist, and a musical director. And for many years, the music followed the German tradition. And I walked in, and I heard an organ playing. And when I heard the organ playing, I turned around and walked out, because I didn't think that was the temple that I would be going to. Eventually, when I was president, at uh, Rabbi Hausman's uh, urging, uh, we brought uh, uh, a cantor to our congregation, and this was the, uh, our first cantor. When Eli came and he brought in more of the Hebraic type rather than German type music into the uh, services, the music was very, very beautiful. Eli. Uh, had a magnificent voice, and he formed a, qu a choir for Temple. At first, we did not do the High Holy Day services because we weren't all that great, to be honest with you, but it was a choir. And really, this was the beginning of the music, of making our own music in Temple. In 1978, Carl Nalloway Jr. joined the staff as Temple organist. He became Chazan in 1983. Carl brought to our music uh, a depth of uh, emotion and feeling that uh, is exquisite. And he is a superb cantor. This is my family. There is no other way to describe it. I think that's why I've stayed as long as I have. No matter what changes the future brings, it's clear that beautiful Jewish music is here to stay. In the 19th century, when B'nai Israel followed the Orthodox tradition, women were segregated from men during services. The females take no part in the exercises, except the repetition of the prayers. They are hidden from view in the back seats, and by their silence and seclusion remind one of the veiled inmates in Mohammedan mosques. But even in the early days, women played a large part in B'nai Israel and in the Sacramento community. Jesse Yashby later wrote about several of these women. The first was Bertha Elkus. Bertha was very prominent in Sacramento life. She is considered the patron saint of Sacramento music. She was one of the founders of the Saturday Club and of the Sacramento Symphony. Bertha Elkus also founded our Sacramento Red Cross. The other woman that I wrote about was Sophie Price. The Price Fund of the Temple is named for her mother. 
Sophie Price was outstanding as, as a teacher and educator, and she also brought woodworking and manual training into the Sacramento School. In 1927, the Ladies Hebrew Benevolent Society, a group of civic-minded women from B'nai Israel, changed its name to Temple Sisterhood, the first group in the country to use that name. I was president of Sisterhood during, at the end of, during the war, and I had to give a report from the pres, pres, to the president and the board once a month when they had their meetings. They, put me, they would put me in the kitchen while they conducted their business. When it was my turn, somebody opened the kitchen door and let me into the board. And when my, when my time was up, I, I was asked to leave. That was the first, <laughs> that was about as much of women's lib as we had in those days in our temple. The woman's role has changed greatly because now we have women on the board and we've had several women presidents and uh, they are equal. From the inception, women have been a huge part of the educational process here, part of the leadership, um, not just in sisterhood, but also in the larger temple community as well. I think there's been an increase in this past year because I think more and more women are also reaching out for roles in liturgy in a way that they might not have before. Sacramento's Jewish population reflected the growth pattern of the population as a whole. The first big wave of immigrants followed the discovery of gold. Over the next 100 years, Sacramento's Jews continued to flourish as the area steadily grew. The second big influx of Jews came just after World War II. Former servicemen who had experienced and liked the casual California lifestyle returned to Sacramento, and B'nai Israel again experienced a surge of growth. Some men arrived with families in tow. Others came alone. B'nai Israel welcomed all newcomers into its sheltering embrace. <laughs> 